Uh, first, before you watch this video, uh, if you do not understand why we have the remainder theorem, basically it will not affect a lot. Uh, usually, if you can apply that properly, then uh, it should be fine. But uh, it's always better to understand why we have this theorem. And then it's all start from some number. This is the previous question information. We just leave it apart first. Uh, we may just consider 13 divided by 4. And then you may ask, oh my god, why you have to ask this so stu stupid question? And then you will do something like this. 13 divided by 4. The result is 3. And then we got 12 here. That means the remainder, that the invisible part is 1. And then we will say that the quotient when 13 divided by 4. The quotient is equal to 3. And then the remainder is equal to 1. And a little bit more is the divisor is equal to 4. Uh, what I want to emphasize is the relation between 4, 3, and 1. How can it build up 13 here? 13, how does it come from? Is 12 plus 1, right? So basically, 13 is equal to 12 plus 1 in your calculation. And then how 12 related to 3 and 4 is 3 times 4 plus 1. That means you can rewrite the original number by using this method. The original number is made by first. This is the quotient. Second, this is the divisor. And the last component, it is the remainder. So, uh, basically, you can do the same for the polynomials. Uh, again, at the divisor here first. Don't forget it. How you rebuild it is the quotient times divisor, the divisible part. And then we have invisible part. That means the remainder. If we continue, that means I can write fx should equal to the quotient times the divisor and then plus the remainder. Now, because uh, if I just asked you about the remainder, you're not really concerning the quotient if, then uh, and I do not want to use the long division because it's quite troublesome sometimes. So I will just use this one. Uh, quotient usually we label as QX. And then divisor here is given. Divisor is they ask you to divide by X minus 1. So X minus 1 from the question. And then plus the remainder. And this relation is always correct because we just rebuild the polynomial by this item. But at this moment, I don't know what is quotient, I don't know what is remainder. If I want to know the remainder only, I don't care about this and I don't want to affect by this. So that's why we are thinking, how about if we can substitute some value of x such that we don't need to care about this. This is made by two terms. Then you think about how can we make it become disappear. That means if you multiply zero, then this one, no matter what is the quotient, I just simply annoy it, right? So that's why we are going to consider a suitable x. Consider when x is equal to one. Basically, it can be two, can be three. But if you substitute two or three, then qx is still here. Then mess up with remainder, then we don't know how to find the value. But if x is 1, this factor will become 0 as follow. If 1, no longer x, replaced that by 1 already, is equal to q1, and then times 1 minus 1, and then plus the remainder. That means f1 
is equal to Q1, I don't know what is this, but we just simply multiply it by zero. Anything times zero, you may just simply ignore it. And then pl uh, plus remainder. Originally, there are two terms, but now only remainder is left, so it's give us a hint. If we substitute suitable x to the original function, then that one is our remainder. That's what remainder theorem tell you. So, demonstrate again is the remainder is equal to f1. What is the meaning of f1 is what you learn in form 3. Uh, sorry, I mean chapter 3. Is something part 3 minus 7 something part 2 plus 5 something plus minus 4. Uh, that means the original function replace x by 1. That means 1 minus 7 plus 5 minus 4. Then we get negative 6 plus 1, that means negative 5. So that's how us to find out the remainder, which is consistent with our long division result.